Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amelia Alverson, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's Columbia Inside event. As you know, today we're exploring journalism in time of crisis. In a moment, I'm going to introduce you to our host, but first I want to deal with just a small logistical issue. If you'd like to ask a live question, please look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a Q&A function and a member of our staff will let you know if, you're, if we're able to take your question live. And now it's really just my great pleasure to introduce our host, Alelia Bundles. Alelia is Vice Chair of Columbia's Board of Trustees and Vice Chair of the Columbia Alumni Association. After graduating from Columbia's Journalism School, greatest school of journalism in the country, she was a producer with NBC News and then a producer and executive with ABC News. She's the author of On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, a biography of her great-great-grandmother that she actually began while she was a student at Columbia. And this was the inspiration for Self Made, the recent Netflix series and hit starring Octavia Spencer. I cannot think of a better host for today's discussion than Alelia Bundles, who is truly one of Columbia's treasures. Alelia, over to you and thank you. Thank you, Amelia. It's really great to be here today to talk about something that is essential to democracy, local news. The difficulties currently faced by local news organizations, including the many cuts in staffing, as well as the closure of long established Pulitzer Prize winning newspapers are no secret. But what are the implications for the local communities losing their newspapers? What happens to political accountability when there is no more watchdog reporting? Are there solutions to what seems to be an unrelenting, economically driven decline in local reporting? Fortunately, we have three experts here today to discuss these and other questions. It's my pleasure first to introduce Nick Lemon. Nick is Dean Emeritus of Columbia Journalism School and currently Joseph Pulitzer II and Edith Pulitzer Moore Professor of Journalism and Director of Columbia Global Reports. He also led the launching of Columbia World Projects. In addition, he is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of several highly acclaimed books, including Redemption, The Last Battle of the Civil War, The Big Test, The Secret History of the American Meritocracy, and The Promised Land, The Great Migration, and How It Changed America. Nick, thanks for being with us. How are you this evening? I'm great, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, I have to wave the flag for the J School. <laughs> Absolutely. Good for you. And now Margaret Sullivan. Margaret is the Washington Post media columnist and the former public editor of the New York Times and author of Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy, our inspiration for this evening's discussion. She recently received a Mirror Award for the best story on media coverage of the Trump impeachment. She began her career as a summer intern at her hometown newspaper, The Buffalo News, and became the first woman to serve as its top editor. How are you, Margaret? Doing well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad to have you. Thank you. And finally, Rachel Martin. Rachel is a host of Morning Edition, as well as NPR's Morning News podcast, Up First. Before taking on this role, she hosted Weekend Edition Sunday for four years. She has also served as national security correspondent for NPR, covering both defense and intelligence issues. She started her career public radio station KQED in San Francisco as a producer and reporter. Doing well. Thank Rachel, you so much for, for joining us. Me. How are you? Glad you're here. So it's wonderful to have all of you here with us this, today. I'd like to start off with a big question based on the title of today's event, Journalism in Times of Crisis. Our society is clearly in a great crisis, multiple crises really. As Margaret's book makes clear, 
we're in an existential crisis in journalism. How do all these crises relate? In what ways do today's enormous societal challenges underscore the importance of reporting at every level? So I'll leave the three of you to discuss and I'll rejoin the conversation to share questions from the audience. Thank you, Nick, take it away. Thank you, Olivia. And let me just, we, she referred to Margaret's book. You won't be able to see it that well. This book comes out in a month. Um, it's called Ghosting the News and, and you can order it now on Amazon. Um, so just to sort of set this up, um, I live in New York and I teach at Columbia. So when I try to talk to people about this, um, especially maybe my Columbia faculty colleagues, I'll say, first of all, you know, journalism is in a, a, a economic crisis and it's had tremendous job losses. And they'll say, oh, I know how you feel because we have a hiring freeze. We weren't able to do a hire next year. But, and I say, no, that's not what we're talking about here. So we need to sort of clarify what economic crisis means. And then the other thing people often say to me in New York is, I don't understand what you're talking about. There's more journalism than there ever was before. Uh, what about Twitter? What about, you know, my news feed on Facebook? I feel like I, you know, there's cable news. I can't get away from the news. There's more news. How can you tell me there's less news? So, so I want to throw that to Margaret to sort of clarify and explain what is the basic phenomenon we're talking about here. Thank you, Nick. And it's great to uh, be with everyone here and, and to be discussing a subject that's certainly near and dear to my heart. Um, what, what, uh, what wasn't said in the introduction is that I not only started off as a summer intern at the Buffalo News and became editor, but that I spent 32 years there. So, um, it, you know, it's local news is kind of um, um, really in my blood. Um, I, I think that while there is a great deal of information out there, and a, uh, some of which is accurate and some that is not, the place that we are becoming poorer in information is in um, watchdog reporting on the local level. So in places like, for example, Cleveland, in Detroit, in Los Angeles, uh, in Miami, um, in Denver. In fact, I like to give Denver as an example. At one time, and it wasn't that long ago, Denver had two big local papers, and they each had a staff of about 300 people, the, the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. Well, the Rocky Mountain News has gone out of business, and the Denver Post, which once had 300 people, is down to under 50 in its newsroom and is owned by uh, a, a profit-hungry hedge fund that um, doesn't seem to care about journalism and you know is really just sort of sucking the last profits out of this um, organization. And the other thing we know is that while there is a lot of distrust and mistrust in the news media, local news is relatively well trusted. So it, it, the, the problems of local news add to the problems of um, th this mistrustful feeling toward all media. So what, what's driving this? What made this happen, this, this tremendous you know, job loss and shrinkage of, of local news? Well, two things really, and they're related. One was uh, the coming of a little thing called the internet, um, which really changed, you know, for years and years, uh, newspapers, and I'm not talking in the book just about newspapers, but newspapers are, are very important. Newspapers were funded largely, their revenue came largely from print advertising, you know, car dealers, grocery stores, department stores, and so on. The, uh, you know, classified advertising. The internet comes along, Craigslist comes along, and suddenly classified advertising it essentially disappears. Um, so, so the revenue base um, has really, really dwindled. And, and that has been going on for, for many years. You know, meanwhile, people's habits have changed. They tend to get their information online. And newspapers haven't done a wonderful job of um, transforming themselves into a digital first kind of business. So it's, it's not all outside forces that, that have 
that have um, affected newspapers so badly. And then, you know, much, much more recently, add in the economic downturn that comes with the pandi the global pandemic and, um, you know, whatever residual print advertising was shoring up these companies has really gone away. You know, people aren't looking for uh, restaurant ads at this point or anything, you know, travel ads, anything like that. All of that revenue has disappeared. And so just when uh, local news is more um, germane than ever before, uh, newspaper companies are finding they don't even have the money to support their much smaller staffs and they're laying people off or sometimes, go, or the, in some cases, they're closing their doors altogether. Oh, um, Rachel, let me ask you, given all this, another question I get when in my rare moments when I'm not around journalists, they sort of say in a gentle way, you know, we don't have barrel stavers anymore. Uh, why do we have to have newspapers? Uh, sure, it's a dying industry, but why should we care? Why is it a public policy issue? Especially when now you have citizen journalism, can't that take the place of, of all those disappeared jobs in Denver? Well, um, this is the uncomfortable part where we talk about whether or not about what it means to be a professional journalist, right? And you often hear from people, I'm sure you hear this all the time, what's your credential? I mean, you know, you're, there's a J school, but you know, what training did you get? So much of this is subjective. Why should we trust you? And, you know, sometimes it gets complicated to make that argument because it's about, um, it's about the mechanisms that <laughs> the institution has put in place to, to create the, the thing, to create the journalism. And people either have faith in those mechanisms or they don't. And that's, I think, if Margaret, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this too, but it's a, it's a trust crisis right now. And, and so much of where I think journalism, uh, I know my shop in particular in the last couple of years has tried to remedy that by being more transparent about the process. Um, and and who's doing the storytelling, right? Like we're not, no one elected us to be the arbiters of truth. Um, and so we have to prove that we're worth it, right? And, and that means being more transparent about sourcing and in, in our investigative journalism, for sure, we have done, uh, uh, we have made it a priority, I think, to be more transparent about um, where we're getting the information, how we're getting the information, and it it's about our reputation as news organizations and and the faith that people trust in us to get it right which is why when we get it wrong which we always do because we're people um there's just no there's no room for error anymore because um the the stakes are too high if you make one mistake then the trust gap deepens and so you know it is it is about proving yourself every time you get on the air or you go to print that uh, you're the place that people should put their faith in when they're trying to understand really complicated events around the world. Margaret let's go back you know just to get concrete with this to your Buffalo days just tell us what I mean if I can be forgiven for using the term good old days in the good old days of the Buffalo News, what did it do? What did the reporters do? What did the editors do? What role did it play in the community and the, and the politics of the area? And um, who was your owner and, and, and how did that relationship work? So shortly before I came to the Buffalo News um, in 1980, um, Warren Buffett had bought the Buffalo News and um, he, he later bought a number of other newspapers, but in the late 70s and through much of the 80s, he had the Buffalo News and his Berkshire Hathaway empire was, was much, much smaller. And he was paying a lot more attention to um, what was happening in Buffalo. And we had, uh, you know, in my very early years there, um, a competitor. We had the Courier, the Buffalo Courier Express was the competitor of the Buffalo Evening News. And it was a head-to-head -head competition. And Buffett, uh, in his wisdom, knew that uh, if we were 
going to be successful as a company, we needed to be, um, you know, the only game in town. And, and in many communities at that time, the second paper was going out of business. So he wanted to make sure that we were the ones who were going to endure. And so, you know, he set out to, um, through his publisher, um, make sure that we would make sure that we would be the ones to win the newspaper war. And in fact, uh, that, that did come to pass in 1982, the Courier Express went out of business. Well, now, uh, the, if you wanted to get your message out in Buffalo about your car dealership or your supermarket or whatever it might be, uh, well, you'd better, there was no internet, um, you better come to the Buffalo News. And so we made a lot of money and the profit margins were well over 30%. And we were um, in essence, ascending a million dollars a week to Omaha, um, $50 million a year sheer profit, okay? Um, this meant that we could support a staff. I inherited a newsroom staff of 200. And it wasn't a large staff uh, you know, I mentioned that the Denver papers were larger and I thought we should be larger. So I, I was pushing to, to uh, make the staff larger and never really made much headway because the Buffalo News, you know, ran it sort of lean. And lean. Um, but nevertheless, we were able to have reporters in every, uh, in every suburb. We were able to cover every um, town council meeting, every school board. We had a suburban education reporter and a city education reporter and uh, a higher education reporter. Um, when times got harder over the years, and particularly in 2008 when the Great Recession came about, we had to start really cutting the staff. And then, you know, we only had one education reporter and we closed a lot of suburban bureaus. And our Washington bureau, which had always been two reporters at least, and maybe an intern and maybe a clerk, ended up going down to one reporter working out of his home. So it was this sort of constricting process that's being smaller and smaller and smaller. And of course, the bitter joke in newspapers is, we'll have to do more with less. But the truth is, you cannot do more with less. It's a, it's, an, it's a business in which you have to have boots on the ground. You have to have people looking through documents. You, it, it takes time, energy, staff, money to do the job right. And so when all of this went away, unfortunately, we stopped being able to do as good a job for the community as we had done before. Um, Rachel, could you talk a little about when you worked at KQED and, and what that local news experience was like? Sure, I mean, KQED is a specific public radio station. Um, it is not representative. It is, it is a hugely popular station. It has, a, I mean, WNYC in New York, KQED in San Francisco, WBEZ in Chicago have um, the highest stations. So it's very well supported. Um, but it was, it was a great experience as, as someone who was just starting out to see what it could mean to be a station that was both tightly embedded into a community, um, but also had national significance. Um, because even though San Francisco kind of gets pegged into this weird, oh, it's a weird San Francisco story. I don't know if it's national. Um, we still got a lot, uh, you know, it's still a very important um, part of the West Coast, uh, implications for, you know, the Pacific Rim, international ties. And so we got a lot of stuff placed nationally on the network. Um, but it, it, so I'll share a 9-11 uh, analogy. After 9-11, San Francisco ended up being the Bay Area was the largest, at the time, the largest community of Afghans living outside of Afghanistan. And so we were covering both the national scope of this tragedy, um, like everybody else was, but we had a very particular local story to cover. And we were able to do that immediately because we had reporters who knew the place, who were of the place, right? And so we knew 
people who live there. And it, immediately we started be, being able to get those people on the phone. Everyone was doing rolling coverage. But what came out of our newsroom was so important on that day. NPR, the network, was picking a lot of it up because up until then, like Afghans, Afghanistan just wasn't in, in the public consciousness. And so here we were able to give a view of what this particular community of, of Americans, uh, although many of them not at the time, but of, of people, who, how they were enduring watching this. And that only happens when you know a place. You're not, you know, oh no, what, where do we go? How do we find these people? We were already there in the first place. And it doesn't, this, this whole enterprise doesn't work if you parachute in, it just doesn't. And you have to already be in America. You have to be there. You have to be out of New York. You have to be out of DC. And, and even though this is San Francisco, it's still a major urban area there are still a lot of small communities around there. And so it was a great way for me just starting out on my career to see how important it was, that local side of things. So what happens in a community, not to the journalists, but to the community, uh, when there stops being original local reporting about local affairs, local politics, et cetera? What's the consequence of that? I mean, the consequences are absolutely huge. I started my career in in San Francisco, but I'm from Southeast Idaho. I'm from Idaho Falls, Idaho population, you know, 50,000 when I was growing up. And uh, often NPR is the only news you can get when you're out on a combine in a wheat field. Um, you know, and I know many people for whom this is true. Um, this was the, the news that they could get when they were riding the combine. It's coming from, from NPR, the member station. And if they got a subscription to the post register, then that was their other source of local news, which is the local paper at the time. And when that information is cut off, I mean, that's it. So um, it it's, creates a huge information vacuum. People aren't able to advocate for themselves because they don't know what the problems are. If you, Those are the mechanisms by which we hold uh, government institutions, corporations accountable. And if people aren't aware of the problems, then that accountability doesn't happen because so much of accountability demands public agitation. And that then, then it's the citizenry that suffers. You know, in journalism, we talk about watchdog journalism, which is really what you're talking about. Um, my colleague at Columbia Journalism School, Michael Shudson, had invented a nice phrase, which is scarecrow journalism. What he means by that is if politicians know that there isn't even anybody watching them, not specifically on, on a specific story, but just in general, there's nobody watching. There's no scarecrow in the field at all. Uh, that changes their behavior. Um, so Absolutely. you don't even have to have journalists investigating politicians in, in particular cases. It's just knowing that they're present makes a big difference. Absolutely. And knowing that, that people are depending on that, that they are listening, that there is an audience that someone is looking, right? That there, someone is paying attention. And that in and of itself, as you just pointed out, can be uh, a mechanism for accountability. Margaret, um, you know, I was the dean of the journalism school for 10 years, 03 to 13. And it was during that period, um, you know, in that job, one is uh, blessed with going to a lot of seminars and panel discussions as you are now, yeah. Margaret, on the future of journalism. And at those, I haven't, I don't go to them anymore, but I, yeah, I know you do. Somebody would always get up and say, oh, it's not a problem, all these things we've been talking about, because the new business model for news is just about to arrive, like mana from heaven. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, you know, digital native news organizations that understand the digital space. So print will die, but journalism won't die. What do you make of that scenario, that hopeful scenario? Well, it hasn't really come to pass. Um, there were some years of promise. They really weren't necessarily about local news. They were about national news. You know, you had uh, places like 
Policy Mike, which later became Mike, and you had BuzzFeed and you had Vox and um, Quartz and these kinds of places that were, you know, in many cases doing good things and they were digital first, they were born in the digital age. Um, the, the problem is that um, they were in many cases funded by venture capital. Well, venture capitalists, um, you know, venture for a reason. They, they think at some point there's going to be a payoff, but there really never came, the payoff never really came. And there's an expression in uh, the business of journalism, um, you know, print dollars, in terms of advertising, print dollars and digital dimes. And that, um, that has proven to be the case, that there just more wasn't like digital the pennies. What's that? It have to be well, digital pennies. They dimes. may have been digital dimes, but but of that dime, a great portion of it uh, has ended up going to the so-called duopoly of Facebook and Google, uh, which has you know been able to you know reap the benefits of most of the digital advertising, not leaving much for the so-called content providers, uh, also known as the journalists. So. Um, you know, I think it's it was a nice uh, it was a nice dream, but it hasn't certainly hasn't fully come to pass. But having said that, there are there are hopeful and um, encouraging signs in the digital world, uh, in, including in local. For example, I mean, perhaps the primary one is the Texas Tribune um, in Austin, which is uh, a very well uh, run philanthropically funded, but also membership funded news organization that's big, that's watchdog oriented, and is now being paired up with ProPublica, which is kind of the cream of the crop of the, of the investigative digital outfits, and they're doing great work. Uh, if we could have a Texas Tribune slash ProPublica in every American city or good sized community, I, I, that would be great but it doesn't scale. I mean, that's the sort of the lingo. It does not scale. Uh, you don't, you know, actually there is a small um, similar outfit in Buffalo it, it, and it's great. It also has three reporters, you know, as opposed to a hundred reporters. So it's just, um, it, 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 it's hopeful, it's good, it's necessary and it's not enough. But people, if I can just jump in, Nick, people have to pay for the journalism, right? Like the, we need, we, you have to fund it. And it's either going to come from a subscription membership service where people feel a, a connection to the, the content provider, um, NPR that's been in that game for a long time, um, or it's going to come from philanthropies. It's going to come from private sector. It's going to come from individuals who decide that this is a, a public good, that this is a value that they are going to invest in. But unless people pay for these kinds of collaborations and this kind of investigative work, which is really at the heart of watchdog journalism, of accountability journalism, it's just not going to happen. Now, your news organization's middle name, Rachel, is public. <laughs> and uh, it, you caught it, that, huh? It, it, um, it, you know, in many countries in the developed world have government owned and operated public you know, media, particularly broadcasting like the BBC in Britain. Um, NPR at the moment is only minimally publicly funded, but it was started by the US government back in the 1960s. So I'm only yesterday, on the other hand, um, the Trump administration basically fired the high command of Voice of America, which is, a, you know, of type of public media that's been around for a long time in the US. So all that's by way of asking you, is this something where government, government funding, government ownership, those kinds of things can help? Or does, does it have to be about uh, audience support, donor support, et cetera? I think it absolutely has to be about the audience. Um, I have said this before, and I can say it again, that I think, I think public media would be better off to to eliminate the small percentage of money that it gets from the federal government. It's less than 2%. And right. it's not worth the political headache, frankly. Um, I think that um, it, it often, it's that money that goes to subsidize the, the very, very small rural stations that get the news to that farmer on the combine. 
and, and funds those very small member stations, but we have to come up with other funding mechanisms for them. And I think it's, it's got to be audience driven or philanthropy driven. I mean, and, and I think NPR has proven that when people feel an emotional connection to the service, they're more willing to invest. Um, but, you know, we just haven't seen the kind of, of numbers that we would that we would need to be able to compensate for that 2%. Um, you know, there's a lot of focus on, on philanthropy and, and underwriting. Um, as we all know right now, um, everyone's having a hard time. There's, an economic, there's a recession on. And so NPR in particular, lots of other places are strapped for the next budget year. Um, so that calls that into question. Should there be a government safety net? Again, I would rather there not be. I would rather it be, I would rather everybody pay for the content, you know, even if it's a small amount and it's still not a majority of people who listen to NPR pay for NPR. I'd like to just jump in while we're on the topic of public radio by saying that when I was researching my book, which again was written for the uh, imprint, the publishing house that Nick is the um, CEO of, if I have your title right, President, I guess we call I should you. Change it to CEO. I think it's called director, but I like that better. Call you, please call yourself the CEO. Okay. Uh, at any rate, it's Columbia Global Reports. It's been a great experience for me writing um, a book for Columbia Global Reports. And one of the things I I found in my research is that public radio uh, throughout the country is one of the bright spots um, in filling in this gap that. Um, that that public radio has stepped in to some extent to fill the vacuum that's been created by newspapers business model uh, falling apart so um, you know I'd say there were probably two bright spots one is is local public radio and and one and one is these new all digital nonprofit news organizations uh, well perhaps a third is that in some large cities, uh, Boston and Los Angeles among them, and Washington DC among them, um, very wealthy in individuals, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, um, and, and others have stepped in to buy some newspapers and to help them. But you know, even there, the hope and the belief and the dream is that they will, and, and this is true at the Post, will become profitable on their own. And I guess I would like to make one other point since I've mentioned the Washington Post. The situation we have in journalism right now is that there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a have, there's a group of haves and there's a group of have nots. And the haves are the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. They're making it because they have a national and even a global uh, audience. The ones that are suffering are the ones that don't have the ability to appeal to such a large audience, um, and those are the local, the local outfits. So, and in some ways, the more successful those big guys become, um, you know, how many of us really are going to pay for, you know, three or four newspaper subscriptions? We're probably not. If we, if we get the Washington Post, let's say, um, you know, then maybe we don't get another one. So it, there is a little bit of a zero sum game going on. Yeah, and it, it really maps onto national trends outside of journalism, where it's not just in our industry, but in many industries, there's been a kind of roll up. It's in banking, it's in hospitals, it's in many fields where uh, a handful of companies, almost always on the two coasts, are healthy and, and dominant, and the middle of the country gets left out. Possibly related, who knows? Uh, if you take all the counties in America, when Bush and Gore ran against each other 20 years ago, they each carried about 50% of the counties in the US. 2016, Donald Trump carried 85% of the counties in the US. Um, so people, th these left behind areas such as uh, where probably all three of us grew up, um, for whatever reason, respond to what's going on politically, culturally, economically. And part of that is losing local news by moving way to the right as voters, or at least that's, that's what I see. I don't know exactly uh, 
how it all connects, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, correlation, if not causation. I do think there's, I mean, there is, uh, there are studies that show that when local news goes away, people become more polarized, not necessarily all moving to the right, although that may be the effect of it, but they, they vote less, um, they vote, they, they vote more only with their own party. They don't cross the aisle as much as they used to. They become more in their echo chambers, more in their, you know, in their tribes. And I think that's a, a worrisome thing. Well, this gets back to an issue that, that Rachel raised early on, which is, you know, we in journalism, at least the three people you're seeing on your screen, believe that most of the time there's something called the truth and it's different from just whatever is you think is the truth or is your opinion. And, and um, it can be established, found out and stated. Um, but a whole lot of people don't trust that that's what we're doing. Um, is, what can we do to, to repair that or to have uh, more of the public have the view of us that we tend to have of ourselves? I mean, to me, that's one of the really, it's a very um, tricky and a very hard to solve problem. Uh, it seems like the more we try to prove how trustworthy we are, the less, the less people do um, trust us. Uh, the Society of Professional Journalists did a project on it this past year, and they went to Casper, Wyoming, the, the place where news is trusted least uh, in the right. And they right. did a, you know, they they did a months long project where they met with people and tried to explain their process and did what Rachel said about being totally transparent about how we do business. And by the end of it, it's like, well, you know, people made friends, but they really hadn't changed their point of view on whether the news media was trustworthy. So it's, it's, it's. I don't know the answer to that. It's tricky. It, when there was more local media you would be likely to see, uh, you know, if you had a kid at the local grade right. school and then the reporter from the paper also did, you know, you could see he was a regular guy, you could talk to him, you might run into somebody in the grocery store. Um, with, with more and more reporters in Washington, D.C. and on the West Coast, um, it, it doesn't happen as much. It's not as normal a part of our lives. Yeah, my grandparents are actually from Casper. And um, was Vice President Cheney, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yes. No, he fly fishes in our river. No. Yes. Um, my claim to fame. Um, but so much of it is just a culture of um, we are out here and anything that happens on the coast in the so-called intellectual centers, they don't understand us. And, um, and for good reason, because the coasts are often missing what's happening in their lives. Right. And um, it, it, it is about being on the ground. And it, Margaret's exactly right. It's about personal relationships and 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 who who you trust as your curator of truth. And if you know who those people are, if your kids are in school together, and like any issue, if you are suspicious of someone for whatever reason, if you know that person and you know the sum total or at least close more dimensions of who they are as a human being, then you are more likely to to trust them and when those newspapers are gone and those reporters are then gone and all they're getting is uh, the New York Times, you know, a bunch of like liberals from the East Coast who think of them as, you know, hicks in Wyoming, then they're like, they're, they're, I have no time for that because they don't understand. When at, at NPR in particular, how do you all deal with this issue? Um, do you find that, that, uh, I mean, there is a perception, surely unfair, that NPR is part of the liberal media. Is there is there anything that that sort of dents that with with conservative listeners? Um, it actually, it's so funny that that's the public perception because when you when you and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the data in front of me, but when you poll listeners, um, there are far more Republicans self-identifying Republicans and then self-identifying conservatives who listen to NPR um, than, than many people might suspect. Um, members of Congress, they, they all listen to NPR. They, they quote NPR. 
um, they, they don't want to be seen endorsing it, um, but it's, it's a completely false narrative. Um, I mean, I just challenge anybody to come up with a demonstration of that. I mean, I think any, any um, outlet needs to be responsible for the stories that they choose and why they elevate them. And I think if there's any critique of NPR, it's in perhaps story selection. Um, but in terms of, of fairness, in terms of, of, of having some liberal bias, I mean, if, I mean, it's just, it's just false. I mean, all you have to do is just listen to, to our air for a, a couple of days. Um, I want to just mention that somewhere right around now, I think Alilia is going to come back and start feeding us questions. Um, but that's her Call, uh, but just just so you're kind of psychologically ready. Um, <laughs> Does it take that kind of psychological <laughs> What are you going to ask us? I was a mind reader. There you go. That's that's right. I was I was just waiting to come back in, but the conversation is going so well that I'm really almost tempted to not interrupt you. But we do have some great questions from the audience. Except as I'm listening to you, you really have uh, anticipated the things that they wanted to talk about. Uh, but I, so I will just mention those who submitted um, questions. We've had questions from Sheldon Buckler, Carlos Munez, Alan Hyman, George Wiegers, and David Panache. And I'm hope I hope I'm pronouncing those names at least roughly um, the way that they're supposed to be pronounced. But some of the things that you were talking about, the polarization when Nick was talking about 85% of the counties voted for Trump and how much that's changed between, you know, within the decade. And then Margaret mentioned when local news goes away, people become more polarized. So this first question really is uh, that question. We are in an age of increased polarization, which we certainly see playing out in the lack of trust people have in national news organizations. Do you see a role for local news here? And I think you talked a bit about public radio, but you know, is there a solution if there are not these local news organizations that are really going to the school board and going to the, the meetings, the sort of on the ground nitty gritty stuff? I'll, I'll jump in there uh, with what, one of the things that I uh, wrote about, kind of a peculiar example in my book is um, a situation in, in East Lansing, Michigan, um, in which this woman, uh, uh, you know, smart PhD, uh, an author, decided that there wasn't, you know, there was news from Lansing, but not much from East Lansing. And so she started a, an organization, uh, a news organization called the called East Lansing Information. And she did it with, um, you know, kind of regular people, some retirees and some, uh, as she puts it, housewives and others who um, had some ability to, to, to spend the time without expecting to get a big salary. And she basically taught them how to go out and cover uh, a school board meeting and a, and a town board meeting and so on. And while I'm not suggesting for a moment that that is the answer, I think the answer isn't going to be one thing. It's going to be a patchwork of many things. And so this kind of um, unusual, um, but fairly successful um, thing, you know, can be a uh, can be a part of that, and that will at least provide um, some of that scarecrow journalism that that Nick's colleague was talking about. And I, you know, speaking of that, I'd like to mention my experience uh, at the the Youngstown Vindicator, which actually went out of business altogether last summer. It closed their doors, meaning that a pretty big city in Youngstown, Ohio, no longer had a newspaper at all. And it became the largest American city to have no newspaper of its own. And I interviewed the longtime publisher and he said, I mean, it speaks directly to this idea of the scarecrow journalism. He said when they were bigger and more successful, that they got around to all the different municipal meetings. And he said that the, that the office holders knew we were there. And I remember this quote and he said, and they behaved themselves. So, uh, and then when you're no longer there, they don't have to behave themselves anymore. So Nick, anything? Well, I guess I would just ask, 
the the others. Um, you know, as far as I can tell, the President of the United States never really totally loves the press, uh, but there's, you know, part of the secret of life is you don't always say everything that you think. Uh, but the president we have now relentlessly attacks the press uh, in public almost daily, if not several times daily. Does that have an effect? Um, how, how, does, how does that make our lives different as journalists to have a president who gets up and says, you know, fake news, failing New York Times, et cetera, constantly? I, mean, I think it's had a huge effect. I, I mean, I, I think for one thing, it empowers local officials to to say the same kinds of things. Uh, one of my former colleagues in Buffalo, a great reporter named Jerry Zaremski, uh, uncovered the insider trading case involving Representative Chris Collins, who, by the way, has now been sentenced to, uh, to prison uh, for insider trading. But when he first started writing about this, Collins was putting out uh, fundraising appeals criticizing Jerry and the paper for what he called fake news. Well, we know where that came from and exactly what inspired it. And, and it has been picked up and I do, I firmly believe it has changed people's uh, level of trust. I, I don't know, Rachel, do you, do you agree? But yeah, I mean, I would have made two points on this. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers the interview that Trump gave with Judy Woodruff, where he just said out loud, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna quote him correctly, but he acknowledged that why he continuously demeans, undermines, and, and lambes the belief the press. Um, so that just, that just has a direct effect on our democracy. Um, and then the other point I would make here is that I, it, it's, it draws in the journalist. And so now it's about us. Now, all of a sudden, we're part of the story. And that is an unnatural place for the observer to be. Um, I think it has drawn in some particular journalists in a way that's not good. Um, and it, it is an uncomfortable space to be defending one's profession which is enshrined in the Constitution against the President of the United States and not take it personally. And then the audience or whoever's on Twitter sees the journalist lashing out against the President on this, which is a very uh, normal response. But again, it broadens the, the trust gap because all of a sudden they say, oh, you're not objective. Um, you're criticizing the President. And and I think it's just, I, I think it's really insidious. It's, it's a very toxic attack because it's so sophisticated that way, actually. You know, and you, you mentioned, you know, the you're not objective. And one of the questions actually asked about that, it seems the dominant business model is tailoring news for target audiences. Do you see any hope that objective reporting will return? So... Now, some of us might say it's never really been objective. <laughs> so I'm just curious what you what you think about that. Well, it's a complicated word right now um, in this moment, objectivity. And, um, you know, we could have a whole other hour on that. We sure can. Uh, you know, what, what, that, what stories that means we elevate, what voices we don't elevate um, in, the, in the spirit of trying to be objective. I think more often than not, people journalists and institutions are trying to focus on the word fairness and not some kind of semblance of objectivity because we're just people and it's not natural to be objective because we're all individuals. I think the best we can ever do is to try to account for our own natural biases and work in a diverse newsroom where there are a variety of opinions and life experiences that can kind of check your blind spots. Um, but I don't necessarily think objectivity is the is the word anymore for what we aspire to i guess I, I will i agree with all of that and i would add though and perhaps the question uh the person who's posed the question is thinking particularly of cable news where um you know now we're in an extreme situation in which 
Fox News is practically state TV um, at some, you know, at least the opinion uh, segments of it, very pro-Trump in, in many cases. And CNN and MSNBC have positioned themselves, um, I think, you know, certainly well to the left um, of that and, and probably or certainly to the left of center. So, you, you know, you are really pulled in polls uh, with cable news. I think far less so with network news and I think far less so with most mainstream, you know, certainly far less so with NPR. And, and while objectivity is a tricky word, I think fairness is a good word. And, and I think impartiality is, mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is a completely, uh, is something to strive for. So, um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, remember when President Clinton said that depends on what the meaning of is is? <laughs> um, in a different context. So it's a little bit that way with objectivity. I always say to my class every fall, uh, who here is an objective journalist? And no one raises their hand. Um, so I, I would, a couple of things on this. And as, as you say, Rachel, we could spend a whole hour. To us in journalism, there's a big difference between news and opinion. And there's a big difference between uh, you know, reporting um, and commenting on what's going on, doing original gathering of information. I don't think our audiences understand those differences as deeply as we do at all. So, you know, do you want a, a scientist looking for the vaccine against COVID-19 to say, no, I'm not gonna be objective in looking for the vaccine. No, you want the scientists to be objective, meaning they're gonna be intellectually honest and say, well, I want this to work, but it really doesn't, so I'm not gonna say it works just because I want it to work. They follow the evidence where it leads. And that's what reporters try to do and should do. A separate issue that, that Rachel alluded to is, is you know, story selection, news is incredibly selective. Um, and, and it is, you can't say objectively, this 1% of what's going on in the world is what deserves to be covered and the other 99% doesn't. You know, in terms of all of the racial issues happening right now around journalism, I've written a lot about history of US race relations. And, and you know, there's a lot of racism among whites, there's also historically a lot of just total blindness. Um, you know, there's that great Ralph Ellison novel, Invisible Man. To a lot of whites in the mid-century decades, including white liberals, black people were just invisible. They never thought about them. So there was all this stuff happening in black America that didn't get covered just because the people making those decisions didn't understand that there was something happening. They didn't ever think about it. That's why diversity is so important because you need somebody in the room to say, hey, you know, something's happening that you don't know about. So that you, you, you teed up my next question. <laughs> and people are asking what books they can read. You need, people need to read Nick's books on um, redemption and on the great migration. Those, those should be on that top of that bestsellers list as people are trying to do their history lessons. Um, so this question is, there is no doubt that local journalism is key to a functioning democracy. I am wondering, though, about the same issues of access and diversity that have come up recently around national news organizations like the New York Times. Have you found that local journalism is more diverse, both in what stories are considered newsworthy or worth covering, and also in the demographics of those doing the reporting and editing? So let me just add my little notes to that. The two big stories that we have right now, um, COVID-19 and policing, are both really local stories. They have big local implications. So to are the newsrooms more diverse in smaller places? And how are these, how are we being impacted by not having local news to cover these stories? Poli and, and Buffalo is an example, Margaret. I just saw um, a woman who, a, a Black police woman who was fired because she intervened um, in a chokehold situation. So we're missing that kind of coverage. And are these newsrooms more diverse? You know, there was a huge push to diversify newsrooms um, 
and it and it had some success. Uh, I, I personally was able to double the number of uh, double the percentage of uh, reporters and editors of color in my newsroom um, when I first came on. But then when we started to have to, you know, cut staff and stop hiring, uh, everything screeched to a halt. And I think the place where where local, national, all news organizations fall down the worst on diversity is at the very top. Um, you know, most mastheads, meaning the top editors, are white still, um, mostly white males still. Um, so while the, you know, rank and file reporters may have become more diverse, it's, it really hasn't fully made its way up to the top. And as we all know, that's where the decisions get made and it really affects coverage deeply. So Nick, anything? Um, I, I think it's heartbreaking to have a situation now where you're trying to diversify, it's sort of what Margaret said, a shrinking employment pie. It's much, much easier to become more diverse, although it still presents a lot of challenges. Uh, people need to be pushed. If you're sending a million dollars a week to your owner, um, if you're reducing your staff and trying to cover, you know, be more diverse in your staff and cover more diverse issues, it's really hard, but but I, I agree wholeheartedly, Amelia, with what you said. Policing and the pandemic are both, you know, intensely local stories that have become natural national. Where they happen, where they affect people's lives, is locally, and you know we need reporters covering police forces and hospitals and public health systems. Um, that that information doesn't just bubble up out of the ground, and we need reporters who are attuned to different parts of the community mm -hmm. to cover them. You, you you can't just cover them from one perspective. You should cover them with ruthless honesty and adherence to the facts as you find them. Uh, but it it really helps to have people who come from different parts of the community. Uh, looking for the news because they'll find different things. Right. So, you know, I, unfortunately, we're at almost at five o'clock. And so I'm just like ready for us to convene a dinner party, a Zoom <laughs> party and continue, right. these, continue these conversations. There's so many more questions that I wanted to ask about global reports and world projects and just all kinds of things. And but we we do have to uh, stop because we promised people that we would. But you can they can learn more about what we discussed today, including potential solutions to the crisis of local journalism in Margaret's book, Ghosting the News, which will be available. Thank you, Nick. Available from Columbia Global Reports on July 14th. And I just really want to thank Nick and Margaret and Rachel. Rachel, I listen to you every morning on the mornings that you're on. That's how I start my day. <laughs> Thank so you. she can be heard on NPR's Morning Edition and NPR's Morning News Podcast up first. Uh, and also my, my homeboy, Steve, is, uh, is there with you. So I'm, you know, I'm from Indianapolis, so I'm also from the middle of the country. Right. But I thank everybody from attending. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Amelia and all the good folks who put this together. And have a good evening.